All right, welcome to What's Happening Now on KBLKRadio.com, and thank you for tuning in. This is your host, Bishop, Bishop Bowser, and we have an exciting show for you, and I believe everybody should be listening right now. You don't want to miss this one because we have two exciting people uh, in our midst today that um, folks should be listening to. So right now, I want you to text or call seven people, uh, Instagram them, Twitter them, get it on Facebook, get the word out right now. That what's happening now is live right now from 10 to 11. So uh, uh, call your friends, call your family members, even call some of your enemies to let them know that we're on. All right. So we have a good one for you today. Uh, this morning we have with us uh, Miss Lynn Sharp Underwood. She's the principal lecturer on criminal justice system department at Alliant International University. And we have Dr. Sid Martinez, assistant professor in sociology at the University of San Diego. They're with us this morning, and our topic for this morning is preventing gun violence through policy, enforcement, and community empowerment. And so I want you to call in and join this conversation, and you can join us by dialing 619-919-4745. Again, if you want to call in, you can call in at 619-919-4745. Four five. Now, before we actually get started here, you know, with our uh, guests and uh, interviewing them and and them sharing with us their wealth of wisdom and knowledge that they have, uh, I just wanted to give you a little bit of information that I gathered in my research on gun trafficking. You know, gun trafficking is San Diego's third largest underground economy after sex trafficking, which is San Diego's second largest underground economy, and that's after drug trafficking, which is the first largest underground economy. The underground gun economy in San Diego represents an estimated $750 million in annual revenue. My source is from the gang and sex trafficking in San Diego, reported by Amy C. Carpenter. Carpenter uh, from the, She's a Ph.D. from University of San Diego and Jamie Gates, Ph.D., Point Loma Nazarene University, when they did that report last year. The most effective and sustainable strategy for preventing gun violence uh, are community or population-based addressing the complex interplay of social, behavioral, and inter- inter- environmental contributors to violence. And what is that? Poverty, homelessness, school failure, lack of activities, oppression, mental health problems, substance abuse, victimization history, etc. Preventing gun violence requires changing environments and norms within communities. The primary goal is to reduce crime and prevent gun violence in the most vulnerable neighborhoods, which are black and brown communities. In addressing a strategic, holistic, collaborative approach to helping those who have often been neglected, unable to access services, long-term invested commitment from stakeholders to programs that worked, worked, and positively impacted people's lives in a restorative justice way which values the community programs and surrounds them with the leverage they need to embrace their expertise in building healthy and safe neighborhoods. So we need that in our community. Now I just want to share another stat of some, um, and we're probably going to talk about this a little bit more, I know especially with um, Dr. Martini because he brought it to my attention, but the New York Times did a a report, a study, and um, murder rates arose significantly in 25 of the nation's largest cities last year, and that is according to an analysis by New York Times of new data compiled from individual police departments. According to the New York uh, Times, uh, uh, nationwide nearly 6,700 homicides were reported in the 100 largest cities in 2015, about 950 more than the year before. About half of the rise, 480 out of 950, occurred in seven cities. The poverty rate in these cities is higher than the national average. At least three of these cities have also been embroiled in protests at the police-involved deaths of black males, like Freddie Gray in uh, Baltimore, uh, Laquan McDonald in Chicago, and Tamir Rice in Cleveland. Now, also, according to Sandag, in San Diego, compared to mid-year, 2015, there were a greater number of homicides, 14% increase this year. There were 49 homicides in the first half of 2016, an increase of 14% from the mid-year 2015 when 43 occurred. What the report doesn't tell us is how many of these homicides were gun-related violence. 
Violence is more of a public health issue than it is a public safety issue. Unhealthiness is the result of at least eight deep-rooted public health issues in our community. We talked about some of these, right? Being Our communities being underserved. Fragmented systems like school, churches, community-based uh, programs, families. Uh, third, three, lack of opportunity. Four, social injustice. Five, mental health. Six, economic insecurities. Seven, re-victimization. And eight, trauma complex. Um, trauma, which is a complex trauma, includes poverty, childhood development stressors, physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. Ninety percent of girls have been molested, neglected, and uh, number four, neglect and abandonment. Number five, presence of drugs. Six, grief and loss. Seven, psychological stress. Eight, family, community, and school violence. Now, brown and, and black people live in communities that have been traumatized, and guess what? Trauma fractures us. Rather than saying brown and black gun violence, we should say the brown and black community has been affected by gun violence. San Diego Police Department, we invited them to be on the show today to come share with us because we want to build a positive and strong community, but they declined to come on today, and I was told uh, that my show's topic as far as the police department getting into policies and gun control and some of those issues are kind of broad, and the uh, chief officer didn't want to commit to something like that as far as his show is concerned. So we're going to get right into our interview, and I want to thank uh, Miss Lynn Underwood and Mr. Dr. Sid Mar Martinez for being on the show. Thank you for being on the show. Well, you did a great introduction and it's very much appreciated. I do want to point out that the San Diego report is for the county and that actually within the city of San Diego we've had 30 uh, year to date, which is actually somewhat of an increase but not quite as broad as what's been going on right. countywide. And also, you know, I, I want to commend you on giving us a really good uh, introduction of the issues because all of those things I want to talk about and argue with Sid about. All right. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you say the 30, how, now how, I know you keep good record. And both of you all do, especially with the work we do in the community. And a lot of people don't know that, that we have two <laughs> professionals here that help us with CAS and collecting data and the whole shebang with the work that we do. Now, out of the 30 digits, were you able to look and see how many of those were gun related? You know, I didn't count, but it is a mix. Okay. So it's not just uh, gun violence. Right. Some of it's other kinds of violence. Exactly. And and the other part of that, too, is I looked at some of the locations mm -hmm. for some of the violence, and it was in citywide, it was all over the city, which mm -hmm. also indicates that, you know, sometimes it might be murder-suicide right. or right. it might have been um, a situation that had nothing to do with gangs or anything like right. that in, right. in certain areas. So... Uh, I did kind of do that piece of it. Count suicide in there. Murder suicides. Murder suicide. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, but suicides are huge in terms right. of gun violence yeah, and in a that. community. I mean, it's really uh, something that we need to address. And which brings me to my point, if you don't mind, Sid, mm -hmm. I'll, I'm going to kind of take off. And that is, it culturally, environmentally are the things we need to address mm -hmm. in terms of violence within our communities, both black and brown. Mm -hmm. You and I have had this discussion a lot over right. the last couple of years, right. and, and we need to bring community people together. I mean, you've got uh, Tasha at NCRC, you've mm -hmm. got yourself with CAS, you've got San Diego Compassion Project, you've got Reggie Washington working with kids at the Malcolm X Library, you've mm -hmm. got other folks like Fancy, all kinds of things, right. you know, people working with youth. What we don't have, which I think I believe is part of the answer, mm -hmm. is a focused way to deal <clears throat> to deal with those communities that are stressed. Okay. We don't we don't yeah. look at when I took did a minor map of the areas we were serving, there they all kind of clustered in a particular area. And mm -hmm. it seems to me if in those neighborhoods within Southeast, mm -hmm. we were to focus on empowering them, mm -hmm. addressing, having services mm -hmm. for them. We would even go further to the fact of, you know, eliminating some of the violence. Yeah, absolutely. I think some of that's happening because now we've got the um, Community Cohesion, Center for Community Cohesion. Right. Yeah. I think some of that will happen anyway, mm -hmm. but I do believe that, it, that we need to be more focused about doing that within the community because, you know, if you remember the uh, Harlem 
children's zone mm -hmm. that uh, Gregory uh, taught started many many years ago. Okay. He's actually he does it block by block. You know, yeah. and, and and has made a tremendous difference within what's going on in Harlem in New York City. One block at a time. Absolutely. You know, and we need to begin, and 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 they put the services where they're needed, mm -hmm. not you know twenty miles down the road for you to have to go to. <laughs> and go out of the area and get killed trying to you know because well, you got know. somebody looking for you. Uh, uh, what what what? I thought yeah, I know Dr. So, Martin, you want to drop uh, in here? Yeah, thank, thank I you. I took for, a, I took a breath. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me on the show. It's always a pleasure uh, to, to be here. And I think this is a really important topic. Uh, you know, we had the uh, San Bernardino shootings that kind of caused national attention uh, for gun violence. And usually uh, when we talk about gun violence, it gets framed in a very kind of broad way. Right. Mm -hmm. And most of the discussions center on access to firearms. Right. Uh, and I think that's a good place to start. But the question that I have is, is framing it in that way going to address gun violence in black and brown communities, Amen. right? And right. so, so what, one of the things that really got me interested in being on this show is mm -hmm. thinking about what are the unique circumstances and needs for black and Latino uh, communities. Mm -hmm. And so there, then we need to start uh, looking, I, I think the first step to address this is to start asking why are people carrying guns, right? right? That's right. what some people, I've heard some people say that, and I think to do that, you need to go beyond quantitative data collection, right. because the statistics can't tell you that, right? Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing where you need to talk to people, where you need something like hearing people's stories, as mm -hmm. we mentioned earlier, or what I would call doing ethnography, right. where we interview people, where we kind of situate ourselves in the community. And then I would take it a step further. Mm -hmm. I would say that asking why people carry guns is a good start, but we need to know why are people carrying guns in black and brown poor communities? Right. 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 What is it about the poverty and kind of to uh, piggyback on your point, uh, mm -hmm. Lynn, violence in black and brown communities is not randomly distributed. Mm -hmm. We know, right. for example, that there are certain places in the community that have multiple calls for service, mm -hmm. that are the locations uh, of multiple homicides, mm -hmm. right? And so I think we're right, starting to think about targeted areas and what is it about those areas, that's the way to start to address the problem. And, and what, what, what do those targeted areas have in common? They tend to be the areas with the highest level of poverty, mm -hmm. right? And then all the other problems that you mentioned that mm -hmm. come out of those situations. So just to kind of summarize, I don't think we can talk about gun violence uh, unless we start to address issues like urban poverty and what yes. the conditions are like. That's right. the place to start to have right. the conversation. And and that goes beyond the way we usually hear about it uh, right. in the media. And I know, I know, and, and Lynn, both, I, I believe both of you guys have some experience in this area. And when we talk about that, when we come back, I want to take a break in a minute. But I want to also get into this um, uh, uh, thing that I hear they're trying to start in San Diego uh, calls uh, what they call a shot spotter or a, uh, mm -hmm. spot shooting or whatever. Right, right. Or somebody shooting to be able to pick it up or whatever. You know, because uh, investing in that kind of money in a community where you can actually provide resources and services to actually help people that's been affected, I think, you know, it's another way to just come in and um, uh, arrest People throw them away and never fix the problem. You know, just just tacking the symptoms, so to speak. Right. And so I, I want us when, when we come back to to look at that. But before we go on this break, I know in the reports, some reports we read, you know, uh, there's a little spike in in some cities and some places. Right. And what's going on? Yeah. So I, I so I read that article. I read two. I read the New York Times article and then uh, Larry Rosenfeld. Uh, He's the one that actually uh, authored, uh, was the author of the article the New York Times is responding to. Um, and so he gives three explanations, and we can come back to these. The first okay. one he talks about is recidivism, right? Mm -hmm. You've got people coming in and out of jail. Maybe they're responsible for the spike in crime. A second one is uh, increasing drug markets. And the one that I find most interesting, and maybe we can talk about yeah, this, is, is what he calls the Ferguson effect. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. The Ferguson effect has two parts to it. One is... Police don't uh, uh, police aggressively because they're afraid of flare-ups, protests, riots. Mm -hmm. And the other part of it is the distrust that comes out of areas where there's police-involved shootings so people don't 
we work with the police. Right. So those are the three issues that are kind of we that need come out of that. of that report, and then we can maybe, uh, if you want to discuss okay. those more. Yeah, we, we can talk about that a little bit more. Uh, we want you to stay tuned. We're going to take a break for uh, brief commercials. Stay tuned, and we'll be right back to what's happening now on KBOKradio.com. Sunshine, Blue Skies, and KBLK. All right, welcome back to what's happening now on KBLKradio.com, and thank you for staying with us. And while we was on break, we, we kind of had a little little discussion. Argument. Here, so. Little argument, you know, and, you know, whenever Lynn is around, we're going to have some <laughs> arguments. <laughs> so, but uh, but uh, one of the things that, uh, Dr. Martins, you were talking about is the Ferguson effect. Yes. And uh, can you get into that a little bit? Because yeah. I have my opinion uh, okay. about, you know, Ferguson effect. So let me just try to, try to break that down a little more. So the Ferguson effect, from what I understand, there's two parts to it. The first is um, when there's police-involved shootings and when there's protests, that the police become aware of this, and they become sensitive to it to the point where they're sort of concerned that if they start policing in a sort of proactive way, mm -hmm. to put it mildly, mm -hmm. that it'll stir up more controversy, there'll be more protests. So in a sense, what they do is they back up. They, they don't patrol... Uh, I don't want to say as effectively, but maybe as aggressively or mm -hmm. as proactively, mm -hmm. and as a result, crime goes up. Right. That's the that's the first side of it. And the right. other side of it is, um, you know, there's a lot of literature in sociology. One of my favorite books, it's kind of a dry read by Randolph Roth, it's called American Homicide. Mm -hmm. And in that book, he looks at the history of homicide uh, throughout the United States, and mm -hmm. he looks at it for, you know, uh, very early in American history up into modern times. Mm -hmm. And what he finds in the book, he says there's one thing that connects the lows and highs of homicide in America, mm -hmm. and he says a lot of it has to do with trust and distrust towards the American political system. Right. So in times when people are patriotic and they feel connected with each mm -hmm. other and they have faith in government, he says crime goes down. And then in other periods where people start to question the power structure, they question the legitimacy of it, he says crime tends to go down. So it's a pretty general theory, but that would be the second part of the Ferguson effect, okay. that there's a police-involved shooting, and let's say there's a homicide, uh -huh. and now people are less reluctant to go to the police, mm -hmm. right? They don't. And and here's 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 a serious issue that I think that people ignore. And I'm just uh, looking at uh, my writings and in some of my work, um, a lot of people aren't just afraid of gun violence in mm -hmm. black and brown communities; they're afraid of police violence. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of captures the right. second part of the Ferguson effect. They're right. afraid if they go to the police, right. somehow something bad is going to happen. They're going to get roughed up, jailed, or maybe even hurt by the right. police. So then what happens is a criminal or a, a would-be perpetrator who committed an act of gun violence is still in circulation, right? And right. nobody wants to right. work with the police. Right. Some people call this right. uh, not snitching, right? right. So it kind of, the, the other part of the Ferguson effect is it exacerbates the no snitching right. mentality, and some people say that's what drives crime. Up. So right. those are the two. Right. So what, what are your thoughts? I, I, I would... I, I yeah. would say that to some degree that that may indeed be true, but also you have to look at communities because of their fear of retaliation within the community as well will not report crimes. And I think we have to take a little bit of responsibility within right. that process as well. Right. I'm not saying that right. there's not some abuse in terms of communities and police relationships, mm -hmm. but I'm also saying that, you know, the other part of that is that you're fearful that there will be retaliation from members in your community right. to you for reporting okay. those crimes. So, and those, and yeah. that's really important for you to include within that storytelling right. process right. because I think that with, if we're going to make a change, which I do believe the conversations help us make change, we need to offer not only the the statistics as you do so well uh, Dr. Martinez but I also think we need to say to the community your involvement and your willingness to report crimes helps us make a difference within these communities and empower people for that piece of the process because if we don't then we continue to go around in circles and have the same conversation five years from now and wonder why and right. I just would suggest that yes let's have this but also let's put that piece in place as well. I can remember when I first started working with the city that there was a real concern that people weren't reporting crimes. And one day, um, someone was driving along and reported a particular crime to police. And I remember Michael Bronker saying, that's a first in the community. And he was really excited because things were beginning to shift and change at that point. This was close to 10 years ago. 
But certainly, we are making some headway. It's not to deny what you're saying, that there's not some of those things happening. But I would also take the tact that we begin to be more responsible and positive within that process. Okay, so let me respond to that. I, I, I thought about that. And because uh, one of the things uh, in that New York Times mm -hmm. article, mm -hmm. uh, Rob Sampson, uh, they quoted him, he's a Harvard sociologist, mm -hmm. and he says, in a lot of these neighborhoods where we see homicide, it's not random. Mm -hmm. There's a long history of legal cynicism, mm -hmm. right, and right. distrust towards right. the system. It's right. always there. Right. So in all of these communities, distrust, no snitching, that kind of stuff is and there. Black but, community yeah, goes right. all back to slavery. Yeah, right, exactly. And, but, but I think what, what Rosenfeld and some of his people are trying to say is when we have police-involved shootings, it exacerbates right. the no-snitching uh, attitude right. even more. Mm -hmm. So if you um, escalate that way of thinking in a police-involved shooting, it's always there. Mm -hmm. And right. it's, it's a major problem. Some cities, uh, you know, they can't solve homicides mm -hmm. because the clearance rate is really, really low, right? The mm -hmm. clearance rate is right. when, you solve, when you solve a murder. So that's always the case. Right. But I think some people would say that when you have incidences... Uh, like uh, in Chicago or Cleveland where you have police-involved shootings, it exacerbates the mistrust even more because it's already there, as, as you mentioned. And, and that's an issue that we need to address, but I think it kind of and, and makes think, it I more think, of an issue than, than but, the past. Uh, and I appreciate the, the statistics. I appreciate the reality of what African-American men have to deal with. Absolutely. But I think we also need to grow a little bit and say to ourselves, we want to make a change here. We want this community to empower the community and to be in a way safer, and we need to begin to promote that as well in that conversation. Right. And so, but where do you, Pastor Bowles, maybe you have something to say. So where is, the, why, why is there distrust uh, and yeah, before I address yeah. that, uh, I just want to let our, our, we want our listeners to be able to call in and participate in this conversation. So you can call us at 619-919-4745. Again, that's 619-919-4745. And so, when, I mean, when you talk about uh, the crime rate spiking and so on, there's, you know, and, and a lot of times people, you know, say no snitch and things like that, that... I find that only among crooks, thieves, and people that are the ones out there committing the crimes and so on and, and so forth. Um, when it comes to uh, 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 community residents who are just, you know, law-abiding citizens and not caught up in anything and so on and so forth, you know, they may have some, I think there's, like you said, a mistrust and it's a combination of, of, of hey, I live here. And, you know, these guys around, and you have me get up and testify, and then next note, the crimes coming through. But that's no different from the mafia or anything else. And one of the problems that I find within the criminal justice system is that, like with the FBI and so on, they have these witness protection programs for all these folks, but they don't protect our people. Mm -hmm. When our people come forward and testify, um, uh, they leave them wide open to be retaliated against. And that's in any race, any group. I think that it's more of a crime issue versus, you know, and the, the, the typical, you told them we're going to get you or we're going to keep you from testifying. And that, that goes to any race, any group, any gang, whatever you want to mm -hmm. look at and so mm -hmm. on. But I think it, it, it ties into, at least in our communities, of being able, the people being able to feel protected, mm -hmm. you know, that, that and safe in doing that. And they haven't been made that way. It's almost like you, they are being used. And I've seen people, I went to folks, even with the federal government, I, I had uh, one of my friends called me to go down there with him when he's here to testify and so on. And I didn't, I didn't really see the care of, of, of being really concerned about his life. Mm -hmm. You know, we just want mm -hmm. you to testify so we can convict these guys. And not really, there was no real concern for his life. So, you know, you got to look at that also. And I, I just talked about with the Ferguson fact. I think, you know, that second part that you addressed kind of hit it on where I was coming from is that, you know, in the community, whether the police um, uh, back away or not back away, because sometimes they can be way more aggressive. And 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 because we say, hey, you know, to bring down crime, this is what you got to do. So then they, they're very aggressive, stopping people all the time, arresting people, and so on. And we think that that's the way that you you know uh, uh, prevent crimes from happening and so on. But then you start harassing a lot of people in the community, and then police lose that legitimacy. And then what ends up happening is people start, well, I don't want to have nothing to do with the police. They don't even come to me. And then the police on the other side, uh, Lynn, has to be honest. 
They have to be honest with the community. They have to have honest engagement because they'll lie to you. And and that happened to me one time when my son got into some stuff, one of my boys, and I was going over to pick him up. And, and uh, uh, so I, I went around the corner where the police was, and the police was like, where was your son at? I just want to talk to him. I said, oh, okay, he's right around the corner. When he went around the corner, he arrested him and got aggressive with him. Turn around. Blah, 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 blah. I'm like, what? And then it made it look like I, you know, brought the police on my son. He said he wanted to talk. If you'd have just talked and didn't arrest him, then I'd have been okay, but you didn't talk to him. Mm -hmm. And I asked my son, so when he took you down to jail, did he talk to you? Did he actually what happened? He said, no. So mm -hmm. with me, even in my mind, like, I ain't never doing that again. Mm -hmm. You know, so so there has to, you know, there has to, like, I, and I think when you're talking about that trust right. and building that relationship, that has to be there. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of circumstances evoke, uh, uh, surround the issues that we're dealing with. There like are lots of lots of possibilities, lots of incidences that would definitely say we need to be aware, that both sides need to be aware, mm -hmm. that PD needs to understand the uh, distrust and the community also needs to be willing to right. build the bridge as well. Absolutely. And, and if we're not it's kind of like a restorative circle. I mean, we need to kind of have one of those mm -hmm. in order for the issues that you bring to mm -hmm. mind, and, and you too, Dr. Martinez, and say, look, here's what's going on, and let's re re at least begin to build a c togetherness as opposed to letting it continue to fracture us and not make safe communities. And just to, to go back to your point, yeah, it is it is incumbent on the community mm -hmm. Right, but trust is a two-way street. Right. That's, That's what I right. said. And and you know, um, and I talked about this on your show last mm -hmm. time. You know, one of the the dominant forms of policing in America right now mm -hmm. is what's known as uh, broken windows policing. Right. And broken windows policing is based on the idea, yeah, that you look for broken windows and small little incidences of crime. And a car. Right. And all that kind of but right. but it, but, it, but it also <laughs> leads to going after uh, aggressively policing people for small minor things. And there's a great book uh, I use in my class by Bernard Harcourt, mm -hmm. and it's called The Illusion of Order. And in that book, Harcourt, who's a very well-respected academic, documents how aggressive policing undermines the trust of communities. Because mm -hmm. instead of feeling like they have this positive relationship, they feel like they're harassed for minor things. So over time, mm -hmm. you get things like increased levels of distrust mm -hmm. uh, in communities of color. So... You're right. I mean, you know, if you, if you don't go to the police, mm -hmm. you're not going to put a guy away. And so that, that is a problem. But, but we you also have to think about mm -hmm. police perceptions, not even police perceptions, policing policies. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not saying that's so much the case here in San Diego. I'm speaking kind of at the national level. Right. And I know San Diego's aware of it, and, and they're doing all sorts of things that we're involved in right. uh, to try to improve community police relations, like uh, perceptions about the community, which is a project that you and I are working on, Lynn. But if we're talking nationally, aggressive policing promotes distrust. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's something that we have to sort of take yeah. consider yeah. as maybe one factor yeah. uh, that's relevant to the Ferguson right. effect and increases yeah. in crime. And we have to be able to listen to each other. Yes. You know, and I think that's the key. And a lot of times what I find with, within law enforcement, as long as you saying what I want you to say and, by, and use the narrative that I want you to use, then we, you know, we can pretend to work together. But if you really start challenging me on real issues, then we're not going to have a problem. We're going to have a problem. And that's where I but, find that. But, but we have to be bigger than some of that sometimes. I think that our experiences experiences allow us to take the step forward mm -hmm. within that dialogue so mm -hmm. that we can make the change. I mean, you absolutely have a valid point and absolutely have something that should be said. And in that milieu, if you will, be brave enough, and you are, to say, I want to have the conversation still. Yeah. And well, I think absolutely, but it's, uh, I, I, I agree with you 100% on all that, but it's not me uh, or our community that's being immature in that area. You know, uh, law enforcement needs to step up too and mature and grow and understand that everybody's not going to treat you like a little spoiled brat. You know, mm -hmm. You're going to have to uh, man up, a woman up, and, and be strong enough to hear these issues in the community and be willing to admit some wrongs and some, some things that haven't been right and let's work together to fix them. Both it's sides. Be rough both yeah. it's both be sides. Rough. Oh, we, we will. I'm, we did it all the time. Mm -hmm. But they need to listen too. Yes, absolutely. So, Dr. Martin, you want to say anything before well, I get to my next no, question? I'm ready for the next one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in the brown and, and black community, uh, uh, where are they getting these guns from and, and how? Yo, well, that's a, that's a really interesting question. So this is where I think the access to weapons question does matter, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
there's a great article uh, in GQ magazine that came out this mm -hmm. month. Uh, I forget the title of the article. I think it's called um, Inside the Federal Bureau of Way Too Many Guns. That's the mm -hmm. title of the article. Mm -hmm. And right now, one of the problems is that we don't have a national database to trace where guns come from. Right, right. Uh, so it's not like when you uh, buy a product and you can uh, buy a car and you have a VIN number, mm -hmm. right? There is no national database. So it's not like the police are able to go in, punch in the number of a gun, and find out where that gun came from. Right. Usually the way it works is if a gun's purchased, they have to uh, contact the manufacturer, mm -hmm. try to get uh, the sales record, mm -hmm. and then get the sales record mm -hmm. and figure out who bought the gun. Wow. Uh, and then if you're a um, uh, if you go out of business, then you then the gun dealer is required to send those records to the ATF. They're the mm -hmm. ones that are responsible for regulating the use of firearms. Mm -hmm. And if you talk to well in this article, I think they do a great job of chronicling. They have a picture of a detective here, mm -hmm. and he's got tons of boxes and mm -hmm. tons of guns, and they're overwhelmed. So one of the things that we really need to think about is um, putting into place some way of tracking. Firearms, and there right. is no so systematic way right now. They don't know where um, it comes from. Uh, well, eventually they'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not as easy as punching it into a computer Let and finding out well, where it's yeah, from. Yeah, the, the box is still... That's, that's a problem. I mean, if, if you want to know where these guns are coming from, wow. you know, it starts with having a database to get yeah. information yeah. for these weapons. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a problem. That's a national problem. Maybe there's a way to deal with it at the state level. Mm -hmm. I, I think... Uh, there's been some discussion in California about maybe creating a, a statewide database. Mm -hmm. That would be a good place to start. The problem with that is that a lot of firearms, and we see this in Illinois, that weapons come from other states, mm -hmm. right? So if other states have loose laws about guns, uh, they can easily bring them into California. Or other countries. Yeah, so, you can't, it's hard, so it's hard to track weapons uh, coming from other places. So that's, that's a major problem. Uh, we don't know where these weapons are coming from, and it, it's very difficult to, to determine. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, um, one of the, the, the issues that I think I have as far as with that is that when we talk about, you know, where people get guns from, I know when I was on the streets, you know, we've had people to go buy guns, that can buy guns, mm -hmm. and then we just scratch the serial off, serial number off and so on, and then, you know, Take the gun or break in somebody's house. You buy them on the streets, all kind of ways. But you know, so, but we talk about. Our, our, uh, so we have a um, uh, a call in. Uh, who are we talking to? This is Mark, Mr. Bowser. Hey, what's up, Mark? Thanks for calling in, man. How you doing? How you doing, Doctor uh, Martinez? Good, good. Good. So, so. I wanted to touch on what you guys were talking about when it comes to uh, distrust uh, within the community. Come on. And to me, what's, what's really missing is, is, is effective communication. <clears throat> and, you know, talking, we're always talking about, you know, bridging the gap and, you know, uh, bringing unity back to the community. Uh, but these real conversations, to me, are, are happening within the community, <clears throat> but are police willing to have those conversations too? Right. Are they willing to, to accept and actually admit that there are problems Thank you. within their own department right. uh, when it comes to police brutality. When it comes to, I mean, look at the CRB. Mm -hmm. you look at the CRB, everyone on the CRB, predominantly everyone on that board is, 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 is someone that's white. Right. Someone that's and white. CRB is Citizen Review Board, right? We, that's what you're talking about? Exactly. Okay. Yes. And another thing is that you look at the lot of uh, Southeast Division, I mean, predominantly everyone on the force is someone that's white. No one that comes from Southeast mm -hmm. or City Heights. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's no one uh, that the, the police department, the police force, doesn't really, you know, uh, the people from the community can't identify with them. Right. Uh, and when it comes to effective communication, there's no, uh, I mean, there's the way an officer approaches an individual right. is very important. Right. Uh, and that's missing. There's so many missing links. Yes. Uh, so that's why there continues to be distrust because, you know, they're not willing to want to wanna hear the people out. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, they're always invited to function, such as, you know, Chief Zimmerman. But to me, I'm going to be real. <laughs> Chief Zimmerman only comes off the function where she's going to be put on camera. But yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, there's so many missing uh, links and, uh, you know, there's so much uh, concentrated uh, disadvantage. Chief Martinez, she hit that on a lot. You know, he talks about. Uh, the, the broken windows, very broken. You know, it, it, 
there's so many missing links in the community. Yeah. How are we going to prevent uh, crime and things from uh, from occurring when we're not investing in the right infrastructure, you know, to promote you know positive social change in the community? Right. Hey, Mark. Uh, I just wanted to. Yeah. Uh, uh, you can finish your statement, but I think, Lynn, Lynn, did you have something you want to say? Oh, no, no, but thank you. I appreciate your call in, Mark. <laughs> well, 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 well I'm, Dr. Martinez, yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a question for Lynn here, because I think she's, <laughs> she's, she's best suited for this. You know, so, so let's think about this. I mean, what are the outlets in the community to have the communication with the police, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's the Citizens uh, Review Board, right? Mm -hmm. It's the uh, gang... And it's not independent. It's appointed by the mayor and so on. Okay, so. and then and then there's the Gang and Crime Prevention, mm -hmm. right? Commission, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And, and so... Oh, you're talking about the commission I'm on. Yeah, the commission that you're on. They don't have no power authority. Okay, so other than those two bodies, what are the different spaces in the community where the community and police can start to have a direct mm -hmm. dialogue uh, about issues of trust. And Lynn, I think you're probably uh, better in, uh, informed on this issue than I am. So uh, what, what are your thoughts about Well, I think there are different places. Yeah, you are. I okay. think there are community meetings that are happening where that kind of thing can happen. Mm -hmm. I think there are committee meetings within the city that that can happen. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, like I said, the Center for Cohesion is a place where that can happen. I think there's a place for the process of, well, I think of the Urban Collaborative meeting on Monday nights at the different places mm -hmm. I just so and and I think if the community were to call forward for PD to come to those I think they would participate understanding this was the beginning of a dialogue right. certainly you know I the community is not powerless in having that call and I don't and mm -hmm. PD is not powerless in calling that okay. as well because they also have let, advice let me just intervene here notice you use two words then you said can and if <laughs> okay, you got to yeah, okay. So, so yeah, yeah. Is, is is there potential? Are there potential spaces? Yes, but is there anything institutionalized beyond those two spaces that I mentioned, where there's a regular, ongoing dialogue that everyone's aware of that brings a broad participation? from the community to start to have those right. kind of conversations. Right. Right. And so, so it sounds like you're talking about the potential, but right. what, what, what is so, in place so, right but, now? but that is, yeah. that is the point. Yeah. We've not... Let me, let me bring Mark back in. Mark? Go ahead, Mark. Hey, hey, you know, that's, that's exactly, that's exactly what's missing, what Sid Martinez is, is talking about. Mm -hmm. It's that there's so many missing links to where, you know, there's not getting people in the community involved. And you know, with me, this bounds around big with, you know, the privatization of prisons. Right. And, uh, yesterday, we just got shut out uh, by the San Diego County Probation Department and the Sheriff's Department from having further dialogue about the injustices in these centers that they have contracts with. And what they want to do to me, how I feel, is that they want to sweep it under the carpet. They don't want the community to get, to get involved so that not only here we are, we're less voiceless. So then that that, that distrust, distrust continues to progress, you know, it, 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 it builds. Where it's like, you know, they're not getting people involved, so how do you expect to bridge that gap? Where's the effective communication when you're not getting people from the community involved? And that's, it, it, it's missing. And right. that's a fine example of something that just happened uh, yesterday uh, with, with these facilities that are in their community. Right. Now, now, Mark, let me ask you a question. Well, I'm going to ask all of your questions since um, uh, we, have, uh, we have you with us. So, uh, everybody that want to jump in and ask us, but what role... Do law enforcement agencies like, you know, San Diego Police Department, Sheriff's Department, so on, uh, play in reducing gun violence? Mark, Dr. Martinez? Yeah, no, no, that's an important point here. And, and, and I want to be clear about my position uh, about the police. The police are very important. And I want to know mm -hmm. more about what they're doing. They're a player that, that I wanted to say this at the beginning of the program that needs to be at the table because there's lots of studies that show that the police can have a positive effect on mm -hmm. reducing gun violence, policing strategies, and that's what I'm interested in knowing more about in, in my research. Right. Um, and we've seen different different examples. Uh, so one of the things uh, that the research shows is there's a thing called hot spots policing, mm -hmm. and that's the kind of thing that maybe you were talking about, where you have the police, mm -hmm. they focus on drug markets, mm -hmm. drug houses, and there's evidence to show that in New York that may have had a positive effect mm -hmm. in reducing mm -hmm. violence. we got to give police credit where it's due, mm -hmm. right? Right, That's exactly. Kind of stuff. I'm not just interested in distrust. I want to know what they do. I want to know what works. Yeah. That's, that's, a good that's, that's a good example. Uh, the other thing that's really good, uh, was there's some evidence to show this, although people are 
uh, having some uh, doubts about this program. You know, Operation Ceasefire was mm -hmm. highly lauded right. as being effective, uh, but if you talk to a lot of people in communities all over the United States, people are starting to lose faith in Ceasefire, right? Right. right. And there's lots of different reasons for that, but Ceasefire, again, was a targeted program. It, it had uh, clergy, it had... Uh, a gang unit, and it had social service. It was a triangle, as right. uh, David Kennedy refers to it. The problem I see with, with ceasefire, and, and there, uh, there needs to be more studies on this, mm -hmm. is that in the short term, it's effective in reducing violence, mm -hmm. but in the long term, the effects kind of fall off. And mm -hmm. the reason is, it, it's a fairly expensive program. That's right. Right. You know, exactly. and, and, and the best way that I can describe what's what kind of the, the you know, the, so the pro, the pro about ceasefire, to be fair, is it has... Uh, short-term effects. Mm -hmm. The con is it doesn't have long-term effects. And the reason why it doesn't have long-term effects is because it doesn't have that community component right. in there. So it's almost, I, I kind of like to equate the uh, right. ceasefire as kind of like the unions, right? The unions come in, they're very specialized, they start a campaign, but when it's over, they're gone, mm -hmm. right? right? And they're, they're only there for a very focused thing. That's right. That's right. So you would need to expand wait, the kind of community support and have some anchor institutions in there for long-term so, support. So let me just kind of yeah. uh, jump on that process in terms of ceasefire. I think that what happened was it was created for that short term. What didn't follow up on was an evaluation process of how do we institutionalize this exactly. in terms of dealing with the community, i.e. making sure communities get the necessary services, that the families get the services that they need, that the youth in that community get this. That there wasn't the groundswell foundational building that needed right. to happen in ceasefire. But that doesn't mean that you can't have something similar right. within yes. a community yeah. and ask for that as community members right. where you have that foundation where you begin to discuss the issues of poverty, educational needs, mm -hmm. social, sociological, psychological needs, dealing with trauma needs, right. putting all of those pieces in place to begin to answer it. And that's, we just right. didn't think of a step two. Yeah. Right. And, and I, I, when I went up to Oakland, I and um, they they um, uh, did a presentation uh, about some of the work they do tied into ceasefire and all that kind of stuff. But the thing that impressed me with that is that they actually passed in a, a what do you want to call it a, when it's a city uh, initiative city or whatever. Right. But that was right. uh, they take a tax out. Mm -hmm. They take a tax out, so they get like twenty three million dollars a year mm -hmm. specifically to do, to address violence, gun violence, and gang issues and things like that. And one of the things they said is that. You just can't have all community, and you just can't have all law enforcement. Got to work together. Right. And so, right. so some money goes to law enforcement, some go to first fire, like fire department, and then the rest of the money goes to communities, right. agencies, and so on. Uh, and, but I, and they work together to to do that, and it's sustainable because right. it's come out of attack. Right. And, and, and Oakland is really clear that this process of working in the community is all of the community, right. Right. and 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 really saying to the community, doing trauma informed care, doing um, reentry projects, looking at it holistically. Right. You can't just look at one or oh, reentry. Oh, now right. we'll look at no. Right. They they integrated the whole process yeah. so that they could begin to have some kind of an impact. And right. and I think here we're beginning to make baby steps toward that direction. Right. The, the one program I, I was really impressed with. Uh, that's kind of gone beyond ceasefire is the program they have in the city of Richmond. Richmond had one of the highest uh, homicide rates in California, and they implemented a program where there was city buy-in. Go further. Sure. I want to ask Mark. Did you have anything else you want to say? Uh, I mean, you know me. I always look at the deeper. I always look at how can we prevent a child from picking up a gun to begin with. Right. So I always look at why not in invest. Like I always say, investing in community-based programs, investing in our children, investing in our Thank schools. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what I, I'm looking at. Right. Uh, instead of investing in uh, other infrastructures, uh, such as, you know, with me, with prison and jail, <laughs> investing in our kids so that's that right. they can pick up books rather than guns. That's right. right. Amen. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. So picking up on what Mark just said, uh -huh. That's kind of what the city of Richmond program does. It, it provides employment. Mm -hmm. It provides all sorts of social services, mm -hmm. and they actually pay people mm -hmm. to participate in the program. And they had a noticeable reduction uh, in violent crime in that city. So mm -hmm. there are models out there, and, and I like the Richmond model because it is community oriented, and it really focuses on employment, providing services, and partnering with law enforcement together. And and most importantly, I think. What a lot of these programs miss, and I think you hit the nail on the head, Pastor Bowser, mm -hmm. 
there has to be buy-in at the city municipal level. There has right. to be funding because what happens? Uh, I'm working on a on, on some. Uh, I was doing some writing the other day, and one of the things that happens is once the budget for public safety goes to city council, that turns into a very contentious issue. And determining who's going to get that money, whether law enforcement should get it, whether a community program should get it, creates a lot of uh, divisiveness. And but so you, also you want to have a commitment from the get-go, like you mentioned, right. that. There's but social dedication. services, social services are funded in this community by the county. Right. So you, we need to understand that if you asking for funding within the city, that it's a partnership that we're calling on for the county and the city to work together within this area to fund the appropriate right. kinds of programs. I think that yeah. needs to be really clear because right. so sometimes the city takes hits that they so, don't so there's deserve. So there's a big term now uh, that you hear a lot of our ur urbanists, urban sociologists talking about, and they call it metro politics. Right. And what's happening now, one issue that, that we're, this city is going to have to come to grips with eventually is that a lot of the urban poor are getting forced out of the city limits. Mm -hmm. They're going out to the counties, right. they're going out to suburbs, right. and law enforcement and municipal government isn't prepared to deal with that population, right? A in good, those areas. In those areas. Right. So having this kind of county-wide discussion about addressing these issues is it's really, really important. important. Absolutely. And, and, and usually that kind of conversation doesn't happen when we talk about these and kinds so, of things. And, and I know we touched on it a little bit, but I, I think we, we, you know, let's delve into a little time that we have left in the sense of, you know, dealing with, you know, poverty and gun violence. Is there a correlation? What connection is there between those two? <laughs> yeah, so, so in all the cities, in all the cities that came all out in, in this New York Times report, uh -huh. the cities that had the highest level oh, of God. violence were poor. Mm -hmm. They weren't just poor. They were segregated, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they were mostly black. Okay, and so uh, Ruth Peterson uh, used, used to teach at Ohio State. I think she retired. Mm -hmm. She writes a lot about this. And mm -hmm. so though, when you get those factors, there's always going to be, there tends to be higher rates of violent crime. Right. And, and that's the elephant in the room. If we're going to talk about it, uh, if we're going to talk about gun violence, yes. We, we talked a little bit about access today. Uh, we also talked about policing today. But the one factor that most people just don't want to touch, and I'm not really sure... If policymakers know how to approach this, this would be a discussion uh, we could talk more about in a future show, is you cannot address gun violence without addressing poverty. Well, I'll give you an Absolutely. example. I'll give you, you an example. You don't, you don't have to, yeah. you're preaching yeah. to the choir. Okay. Well, no, I, I, no, I, I know you know that, but I'm going to tell you something. If you look at most of the debates about gun violence, it's all framed within the context of access. Yeah, right. Right. And that's we need to go beyond that. You know that, I know that, but a lot of people out there don't get that. Right. Cultural right. conditions are linked to high levels of violence among the poor. This is a report that was done in 2003. I'm yeah. sorry, it's yeah. there. It's there. <laughs> you know, it's not news to anybody who who reads right, and right. studies. So now, one of the things I was I was thinking about, you know, because um, when we're talking about gun guns and, and violence and and also criminalization of it, because you know when you look in, in in the white community, you know, there's a lot of white folks that have guns and stuff. You know, they can have them in their house and they can go purchase them and buy them for protection. But we have kind of like uh, taken that away in the black community and brown community. Uh, and let me give you an example with the black community. You know, one out of every three black persons have been affected by the criminal justice system. They make laws that say that uh, if you have, especially if you have a felony, you cannot never purchase a gun. And so then if that person, because he lives in a community where he has to protect his family, go buy a gun, and he gets caught with that gun, he's a felon in possession of a gun. Right. And so I, I think it further criminalizes our community when on one end, you know, we, we want to reduce gun violence, but then on the other end, uh, I, I see something else where it's, it's stripping uh, a people of color of their constitutional right to bear arms. And I don't see nobody fighting for that you know, hmm. from that perspective. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, that's, yeah, that's a it's a real dilemma, and you know, I, I, I had this conversation uh, with a former uh, hom uh, LAB uh, homicide reporter for the LA Times, and he said, you know, the liberals talk about restricting guns, right? Mm -hmm. Access to guns that cause violence. Uh, conservatives want their Second Amendment right, mm -hmm. but we really don't know what uh, having a gun means for people of color in urban poor exactly. areas where there's violence, uh -huh. and we're. In, when you have poor relations with the police, mm -hmm. uh, and it's not just that you feel that you're being harassed or abused, but people also feel underprotected, yes. right? Over-policing, underprotected, right. then it creates this need of what do you do mm -hmm. for public safety? And, right. and I think it's important to recognize 
when we talk about the Second Amendment, it means something a little different in black and brown communities. Yeah, yes. And when you don't feel safe, um, and, and maybe if our viewers could think about that. I'm some, mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the viewers kind of know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. For some people, don't. Well, what would you do if you lived in an area where there's a lot of crime, mm -hmm. where maybe your house has been broken into twice mm -hmm. in one month, mm -hmm. you've seen violence down the street, mm -hmm. and you don't feel you're going to be protected mm -hmm. by the police? What would you do? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. That's kind of the mindset. So. That's a question I think that uh, that we need to think about as right. a community. Right. You, I don't know what you're Absolutely. Talking about. You know, when I, I when I used to be in a gang and and I got out, you know, I got rid of my guns. Oh man, I'm I'm a person of peace. I don't need these guns anymore. And so and so, I got rid of them in the whole shebang. And after I got in church, got married. You know, me and my wife. You know, especially in the '80s. You know, uh, the the crack epidemic, and you know, uh, folks were getting killed in our alleys in front of our house. It was so bad, folks were stealing your mop and shoes off your porch, and so you couldn't leave anything anywhere. And and then our house got broken into a couple of times. And then one time, I I I, I it was late at night. And I heard some noise outside, like somebody trying to break in the house, you know, and I went and got a knife. I was like, okay, you know, who's trying to come up in here? And I thought about it for the moment. When I went to look, I didn't see anything, but I thought about it. I was like, you know, what does this person have a gun? Mm -hmm. And I'm using a knife against a person just to protect my family. I don't want to hurt nobody. And um, the next day, I went and got a gun. <laughs> and I had it for a while. Then finally got rid of you. Know, I don't have any guns now. But I'm just I'm just using it as an example as what you were saying. As we want to feel protected too, right? You know. But our community has been criminalized to the point to where that you you, you lose your constitutional rights to even bear arm. And I believe that was a direct effect on on people of color. And and you you start seeing the laws that have changed even when you go back to the '60s with the Black Panthers and what they were doing, exercising their constitutional right. And now that, you know, they change laws even with that because it's people of color. But they mm -hmm. make it still easier for a white community to be able to have access when you're talking about access to these guns. And no matter what they do, you always hear if you say, oh, we ain't trying to take your guns from you, hmm. you know. And, but the bottom line is, is that it's not fair across the board. Mm -mm. No, and I would agree with you. Uh, obviously, the, these incidents and the ones that you talk about are things that we really have to look at carefully mm -hmm. before we have conversations. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can't just bl blatantly say, oh, well, that's just, no. We mm -hmm. need to look at what you went through, mm -hmm. what other folks went through mm -hmm. um, in order to address this issue. It is not something that we can do lightly. Right. Yeah, and I think it's important because, again, going back, we frame it in terms of the liberal perspective access to weapons, you know, limiting access to weapons, right. the kind of NRA perspective, which is don't get in the way of my gun rights, right, <laughs> right. which can actually fuel violence. Mm -hmm. And then and then the perspective that we're talking about is, you know, people feel like they need a gun because they're over-policed mm -hmm. and they're under-protected. Mm -hmm. So what do we do about a population that feels vulnerable exactly. and feels like they might need access to guns too? Where, where does the law fit in that? And oftentimes, even if you have no criminal intent, mm -hmm. if right. you have that weapon, mm -hmm. it's not registered, or there's no serial number right, on it because you right. bought it for you a felon, felon right? You know. Then now, now you're criminalized. So and that's, I'm saying, well, I'd rather get caught with one than without one. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, some folks they so it's, are going to prison three or four years. It's or a precarious you know. situation. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. We we wanted we ran out of time. This was a good conversation, and we most definitely got to continue these conversations. And um, yeah, what? Thank you, Mark, for being part of the conversation. Oh, yes, yeah. thank you, Mark. Mark. I think Mark signed off, though. <laughs> he wasn't on the Mark, Mark Bartlett, thank you. <laughs> yeah, he signed yeah. off. Uh, 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 okay. But want to thank all our listeners for tuning in, and please do tune in next week, every Sunday at 10 o'clock a.m., okay? Uh, thank you, uh, Miss Lynn Underwood, and thank you, Dr. Sid Martinez, for being on the show. It was a great conversation, and even after the show, we need to continue to have these conversations until we fix our problem. It is fixable. All right. God bless you, and we look forward to coming back next week at the same station, the same time. KBLKradio.com is made possible.